Thank you. Uh, this hearing has been informative on the specific question of Russian active measures in the United States and in Europe. Of course, that's just one small part of Russia's efforts over the decades to undermine Western democracies, try to divide our alliance. Um, I think we've explored most of those points today, so I want to respond more broadly to what I think are two myths that have been propagated here, mostly by my Democratic colleagues, but by some of these witnesses, and those myths are that somehow President Trump is weaker on Russia than was President Obama, uh, and second, that somehow NATO and deterrence is undermined by the United States rather than by Europe. So first, um, let's re review what's happened in the first five months of this administration. President Trump has bombed the Khan Sheikhan military base in Syria. He has shot down Syrian planes. They have shot down Iranian drones thereby showing that Russia is unable to protect its two main clients in the Middle East. We're on the verge of deploying more troops to Afghanistan, where Russia has been meddling with ever greater intensity in recent years. And we have finally proposed a budget that increases our military spending, albeit not enough, that accelerates ballistic missile defense. And our domestic agencies are doing everything they can to promote more oil and gas production in the United States. By contrast, President Obama famously pushed the reset button a few weeks into his tenure, six months after Russia invaded Georgia. He mocked Mitt Romney for calling Russia our number one geopolitical foe. He asked Dmitry Medvedev in a hot mic moment to wait until after the election to discuss missile defenses because he would have, quote, more flexibility. Despite bipartisan support in the Congress, President Obama refused to send lethal weapons to Ukraine. He stood idly by as Russia returned into the Middle East for the first time in 40 years in Syria, and he stood idly by, as we've heard today, in the 2016 election. So I would dispute the premise that somehow President Obama was any tougher or stronger in the defense of U.S. interests as against Russia. Second, the myth that somehow NATO and deterrence is at risk because of the United States not Europe. Talk is cheap. Deterrence is about the military balance of power. It's not about magic words. National leaders can call Article 5 sacred or sacrosanct or inviolate or any other pretty word they want, but Europe's collective failure to meet the 2 percent goal of defense spending has underinvested in our common defense by something on the magnitude of 100 to $120 billion per year. Vladimir Putin can see the reality of what national leaders in Europe think about our common defense, no matter what words they use. Moreover, it's well known that Russia is in flagrant violation of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. They're also in violation of the Open Skies Treaty, yet European leaders continue to resist the Trump administration's efforts to bring Russia back into compliance with those treaties. Dr. Stelson Mueller, as you noted, the German foreign minister has protested the Russian sanctions bill that passed the Senate 97 to 2 because Germany does business with Russian companies in the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which, by the way, they shouldn't be building in the first place if they are that worried about Russia and want to deter Russia in Europe. While we're on the topic of the German foreign minister, he said a few months ago that the 2 percent goal is unlikely to be attained and politicians shouldn't make promises that they can't keep. Sadly, I'm afraid he's right. Germany increased its budget last year by 8 percent. This year, its defense budget is proposed to be increased by only 4 percent. Yet a Forza agency poll suggested that a majority of Germans oppose such an increase. More alarmingly, a Pew poll from last month asked Europeans if Russia got into a serious military conflict with one of its neighboring countries, that is, our NATO ally, do you think our country should or should not use military force to defend that country? Here were the responses. The Dutch said 72 percent yes, 23 percent no. That is great for the Dutch. They are good allies. Poles, 62 to 26. Americans, 62 to 31, by a two to one margin. Very proud of our country. Canada, 56, 58 to 31. France, 53 to 43. Spain, 46 to 46, not great. Brits, 45 to 43. Germans, 40 to 53, would defend a NATO ally. 
So my time has almost expired. I'll just ask one question, given that so many of my remarks have focused on Germany and Dr. Stetson Mueller, you're obviously the subject matter expert on that country. What is the matter with Germany? Thank you, Senator, for your questions and for, you, for your remarks. Um, I've already said that I'm not a fan of the Nord Stream 2 project. Um, and I think a number of many of my German experts, friends, agree with me. There is a substantial debate within German politics about the use of this project politically. On the German defense budget, I think, again, I can only re reiterate what Chancellor Merkel has said, who looks likely to win this election again, that Germany is on course to fulfill this promise by the time it is supposed to fulfill it. Anybody who has ever looked at defense budgets and, and, and attempted to increase them knows how many path dependencies, complications there are in actually expanding forces. We would have to double our defense budget to do this. But I can assure you from my personal experience, many conversations last week in Berlin, we are racing to do this. In fact, only last week or two weeks ago, I was on a stage in Koblenz together with the German chairman of the chief, uh, uh, the equivalent of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, at the bidding of the defense ministry to explain to Germany's armaments bureaucracies why they have to work faster, more flexibly, and more creatively to accomplish the promises that we have made to NATO. And I assure you that this was a very serious discussion. Now, it will also not have escaped you because we've been talking about this all day that we're in an election and that Gabriel is a member of the opposite party, although he's in a coalition with the chancellor, and therefore he has to say these things. He has also said other things. For example, the first time he went to Moscow, he told Foreign Minister Lavrov, his counterpart, that he did not believe in the post-Western world Lavrov had spoken of in, at the Munich Security Conference, that this was wrong, that we very much stand by the idea of, a Western, uh, of, of, of the West and Western, and Western alliances, and that this is a question of shared values and not of geopolitical location. So, as for the Pew poll, I'm as unhappy about that as you are, and I know many Germans who are unhappy about it as well. Maybe that is, part, that is also rooted in our cultural memory of the Cold War. I'm old enough to remember the Cold War, where we knew that if um, the Article 5 came to pass, there would be three weeks of conventional warfare, then it would move to nuclear, and, and then my country would be a heap of ashes. I think that that is... Some, that is a memory that informs that kind of judgment. But I know that German politicians of all parties have made it clear beyond a shadow of a doubt to Russia, to Moscow, and to the Kremlin, and Mr. Putin himself, that any violation of Article 5 will have us all standing there as one, as allies, to defend an attack on NATO territory. Senator Harris. 